Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sasano, and today's the 19th of January, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So this uh, kind of governance proposal that had been posted to, uh, I guess, Aave to deploy Aave v3 to Arbitrum 1 and Optimism have both passed. You can see here Mark Zala from Aave posted that governance has spoken, Aave v3 will be on Arbitrum and Optimism. So, you know, I've been saying this for, I guess, like a few months now, really, that I expected Aave v3 to come to both Arbitrum and Optimism relatively soon. Uh, but now that it's done and gone through governance, it means that it can actually kind of like be deployed there. I'm not sure like how long until this happens. I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later, given how much Aave has been teasing v3 and their layer 2 rollout lately. So I'm very, very, very excited for that. I think, as I mentioned before, a key missing piece to uh, uh, to Optimism and Arbitrum have been the kind of like missing piece of a money market, right? Like, or, or I mean, they have money markets, but like one of the popular money markets, like Aave, one of ones that have like a lot of trust behind them, you know, the brand awareness, all that good stuff there. So very much looking forward to seeing Aave V3 go live on both of these networks. Hopefully as a simultaneous launch, that'd be really cool to see because I think that you know, Arbitrum and Optimism, as I've mentioned before, they're two of the main optimistic roll-up networks. I know there's others out there. There's kind of like the forks of Optimism, like Metis and things like that. I know that Metis has more TVL than Optimism right now because they have a token to incentivize that sort of stuff. But in terms of like novel tech that's actually been developed by the teams themselves, uh, Optimism and Arbitrum are kind of like, you know, the, 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 the two juggernauts here. And they're basically uh, uh, in a race to, I guess, kind of like get as much adoption as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I've kind of like been seeing this lately where I think the L2s shouldn't be fighting amongst themselves at all and shouldn't be trying to steal market share from each other. The pie is going to get so much bigger with the amount of people that are going to be onboarded through these L2s and other things like that, that I think at this point, um, they should just be focused on kind of like onboarding as many users as possible rather than trying to like poach users from other kind of like L2s. If anything, we should be poaching users from the alternative L1s. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people are only using these alt L1s because they've got cheaper fees. Well, now that we have cheaper fees with Optimism and Arbitrum, you can come back and kind of like use these things, which I think people will do for sure. And I think a lot of newer people will do that as well. Um, but also speaking of cheap fees, Optimism announced today that they've uh, found a way to shave another 30% off the average transaction fees, which is pretty cool to see. They're saying, you know, might deploy later and they think they can get uh, the cost to transfer ETH on Optimism down under a dollar. So currently it's a dollar 43 on our... Uh, uh, and kind of like you can see the comparison between the different networks here, uh, between like Polygon Hermes, Loopering, ZK Sync, Arbitrum, Boba, and Ethereum L1. So yeah, that'd be cool to see them get it under a dollar. I'm sure Arbitrum 1, once they're put in the Nitro upgrade, they're going to be reducing fees by a, by a nice amount. I saw Polly and I mentioned today that fee reduction looks to be about 50% from current levels. So that would put Arbitrum 1, you know, basically on par with Optimism. I'm sure they have, uh, I'm sure they have kind of like other things up their sleeves to get fees down as well. So do all the kind of like networks. As I've said to you guys before, it's really only the first, first iteration that we're seeing of these layer twos, they're going to keep working on getting those fees down as much as possible because that really is, at the end of the day, I mean, one of the major things that they're that they're kind of like, um, I, I, sorry, that, that's one of their kind of like main value adds, right? There's the faster transactions, which is which is fine. I mean, as I said before, it's technically not faster transactions because until your transaction is posted to L1 Ethereum as a batch, it's technically not confirmed, uh, or, or it can, I guess it's, it's technically not finalized. So it's confirmed, but not finalized. Um, but, you know, the user experience is much better. But I think that the real value prop is obviously the cheaper fees. So these L2 teams obviously... I'm going to be laser focused on that, along with uh, other, other kind of like thing, longer term roadmap things like decentralizing out the uh, the sequences and the network in general, making sure that the network uh, can you know can stay alive as 99, 100% of the time. You know we've seen some of the networks go offline before uh, due to various re uh, various reasons out there, but uh, obviously they're all focused on reducing the fees as much as possible. So very cool to see this from Optimism. Can't wait to see you know Arbitrum Nitro go live and to see how kind of like um much the fees can come down there. And, you know, well, I'm very curious to see what the fees are going to look like in a year for all of these L2 networks. Are they going to come down, you know, less than 50 cents, right? For a for a, a transfer, less than a dollar for a swap. That would be really cool to see. We're going to have to kind of like see how that shakes out. But, um, you know, for the time being, I think this is pretty good. Uh, it's much better than L1 Ethereum, of course. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, things like swaps, I guess on L1 Ethereum, like what, 50, 60 bucks. And I think on Optimism and Arbitrum, they're a few dollars still or something like that. So that's an 
obviously massive improvements uh, already, but we can get those costs down further and further, which I'm expecting, you know, at least over the next, I guess, like few years, to be honest. This, this stuff's not going to just be like, oh, well, you know, we'll work on reducing fees over the next two months and then we're done. No, this is an ongoing thing. And there's always going to be th- uh, new ways uh, that, pe- that these teams find to reduce fees. There's always going to be new mechanisms that they can do. There's always going to be new tech coming out. So as I said before, scaling Ethereum or scaling blockchains in general is like a multi-decade thing. It is not a, something that's just going to happen overnight and then we're going to be able to service the world. I've mentioned plenty of times that I expect these networks to be doing tens of millions of transactions per second eventually, you know, in aggregate across all the different networks, whether it be layer twos, layer one, side chains or anything like that. Uh, and to get to that sort of scale and to get to that sort of scale while keeping costs low and keeping these networks live so they don't kind of like fall over from the demand, it's going to take a while. And it's going to take the concerted effort of hundreds, if not thousands of very, very smart people to to kind of um, to, to get this done. The funding's there. Like I don't think money is a bottleneck at all for this, sort, for this sort of stuff. The talent is definitely a bottleneck, but money definitely isn't, which, which helps. Like it helps a lot, right? Because I think that the, I guess like big kind of like funds out there recognize that compute is such an in-demand resource because at the end of the day, these blockchains, uh, the, these smart contract chains are basically just selling compute, right? They're selling block space. Now, the demand for this, as I've said before, is unlimited and is going to just keep expansion, exponentially increasing from here. And we've seen already like pl- a plenty of evidence that people aren't just going to stick with one, you know, comp- uh, compute network, right? They're going to go where the opportunities are, they're going to go where they can afford to go as well. Like, you know, there are a lot of people who, I mean, most people can't afford Ethereum L1 anymore. And, and you know, we need to offer them cheaper compute that still uh, benefits from Ethereum L1 security and decentralization, which is obviously what L2 is doing. But they're also using side chains and other L1 networks because the demand is just incredible, right? And it doesn't, it's not bearish for Ethereum that these other kind of like L1 networks have, um, have gotten traction. I don't think so at all. And the funny thing is, is that Ethereum L1 hasn't, uh, the fees haven't gone down, the activity hasn't gone down, even though these other networks are getting adoption. So the pie is growing, um, and 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 I think it's it's all going to grow together. And it's just a matter of, you know, in ten years, what does the uh, I guess um, what does the what does the distribution look like? Like, what are the big winners? Like, what are the top five networks in ten years? Are they uh, you know Ethereum, maybe one other L1 chain, and the rest L2s? I don't know, right? I'm betting that it's all L2s. I don't know if another L1 chain um, can actually exist, especially in 10 years, can even compete with with the L2 ecosystem because these monolithic L1 chains just aren't as scalable inherently. So we're going to have to see how that sh- uh, that shakes out there. But very cool to see that Optimism is reducing fees even further here. Uh, Starkware put out an update yesterday. They presented StarkNet Alpha 0.8. 7.0. So new features include contract upgradability, which is a huge thing for developers, block number and block timestamp, events, uh, and much more. So you can go to this blog post here to read this. Obviously, this is for developers, not really for um for end users to kind of like worry about too much. Um, but I think that there's a, a, a fear reduction in coming in this as well. Uh, I remember reading, I remember reading something about this, uh, which is which is really, really cool. So obviously this is the sort of stuff that needs to be, uh, oh no, here we go. Initial, uh, what, what's coming next is initial fee mechanism support will be released in a matter of weeks as a subversion of StarkNet. So a fee market's going to be kind of introduced there. So very cool to see, uh, see this here. As I mentioned, you know, yes, StarkNet Alpha went live end of November but I said it was a very, very early version. It was only for developers. It's not like end users were going to be getting much kind of like value out of it, but there are plenty of apps live today using Starquest technology that you can go kind of like play around with and not just apps, but like whole ecosystems, right? Like DYDX and Immutable X and things like that, that you can go uh, play around with to get a, a teaser of um, what's coming with Starknet. But as I've um, mentioned before as well, I've shared with you guys a list of projects building on Starknet. Don't have it handy right now. I remember sharing it maybe a couple of weeks ago. But it's growing, right? Like all these things, as I said, the demand for compute block spaces is basically infinite, which means that the demand to deploy kind of like applications to these networks is pretty much infinite as well. And you're going to see plenty of uh, stuff get built, stuff that isn't even possible to build on layer one blockchains, which is super, super exciting. 
So Coinbase announced yesterday that they have a new partnership with MasterCard. So this partnership is basically, uh, they're touting it as a way to revolutionize the NFT purchase experience for customers. So essentially MasterCard is going to classify NFTs as digital goods, which allows a broader group of consumers to purchase NFTs. And coming soon, they'll unlock a new way to pay using MasterCard uh, cards here. This is pretty bi- a pretty big deal. Obviously Coinbase is making a big move into the NFT uh, ecosystem look, uh, with plans to kind of like launch their own NFT marketplace. Uh, now they're partnering with MasterCard. They're doing a bunch of other things around NFTs as well. Uh, a lot of education around it too and kind of like signaling or doing stuff on Twitter uh, from what I've seen. Look, I, you know, the funny thing is I've been thinking about this a lot lately and there was um, FTX launched their NFT marketplace recently, right? That hasn't really gone anywhere from what I've seen. It seems that the crypto native NFT marketplaces that don't come from centralized exchanges seem to be doing much better. And, you know, we saw this with obviously OpenSea. Now, then we saw it with Looks Rare. We saw it with a bunch of others like Foundation and Super Rare and things like that. The but 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 the um centralized exchanges trying to move into the NFT game doesn't seem to be or at least the NFT marketplace game doesn't seem to be uh, making much traction yet. Doesn't mean it can't in the future, but I think. I mean, I hope what Coinbase does is that they actually move into the NFT game, but act as kind of like an aggregator for things like what's available on OpenSea and looks rare, even what's available on L2s like Arbitrum with um, the treasure kind of um, marketplace on there, Magic, whatever it's called. I think that that might be the better play. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think the NFT ecosystem still has a massive amount of room to grow. And actually, I've got a tweet here I want to talk about. Um, and I think maybe too early to, t- to, to kind of like write off these centralized exchanges as being a big um, a big kind of like a driver of NFT adoption. I think they're still going to be because of the fact they have so many users, but they have to play it right as well. So we're going to see how, see how that plays out. But I put out this tweet today uh, that I wanted to kind of like talk more to where I said, the epic amount of hate that the NFT ecosystem gets doesn't really matter at all. Just look at the growth metrics. All of them are up and to the right and billion dollar companies are investing heavily in the metaverse. Random Twitter pundits with bad NFT takes are irrelevant. So I want to spend a a little bit of time talking about this because I think it's important to contextualize where we are with regards to NFTs and the hate that NFTs get and the hate that this ecosystem gets in general. So let's take a step back and take a step kind of like back in history to Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin in its earliest days, still to this day, but in its earliest days, the popular consensus was that Bitcoin was a scam. Bitcoin was only used by criminals. It was only used to buy drugs and it's going to zero. That was the popular consensus. Most people believe this. Now look at where Bitcoin is, right? The fast forward what, eight to 10 years or whatever it's or whatever it's been since then, Bitcoin went from being worth less than a dollar or less than $10 to over $40,000 today. It, 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 you know, at, at its peak, it was worth over a trillion dollars. It makes it one of the biggest um, kind of like assets in the world by market cap. And that's becoming from a place where most people thought it was legitimately a scam. Most people thought it was worthless and most people thought it was just bullshit, right? There are obviously a lot of people who still think this, but you can see my point here. Those opinions were irrelevant. Now, you kind of like take NFTs in context and you apply the same kind of thinking to that. All the hate, the literal kind of like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who absolutely despise NFTs for one reason or another, the energy use reason, they think it's a fraud, they think it's a scam, whatever. I mean, I think a lot of these reasons that they come up with are basically hogwash, but you know, the hate is there. But look at the NFT growth, look at the NFT ecosystems. The growth has been explosive. 2021 was an absolutely massive year for NFTs. 2022 is shaping up to be a big year again. Looks Rare uh, just launched, right? It's doing incredible volumes. OpenSea is still doing incredible volumes. They just raised $300 million at a 13 something billion dollar valuation. All these billion dollar companies are getting involved in NFTs in the metaverse. You know, yesterday we just saw Microsoft purchase Activision Blizzard for $70 billion and in in their press release, they mentioned um, Metaverse prospects. We saw Facebook rebrand themselves to Meta, right? Like all these kind of like companies are getting very heavily involved. So my, my, my overall point is that it's literally irrelevant what these people think because all these people do is talk. They don't actually do anything when it comes to uh, 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 comes to kind of like um, 
affecting change or, or kind of like um, acting on their beliefs or what they're talking about. All they do is commentate on things. They just talk, talk, talk. They hate, 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 and they don't do anything. They don't add any kind of like value. They don't try to, to change anything. They don't try to make anything uh, a better experience for people. They just love to hate. And as I as I use the Bitcoin example, um, and even the Ethereum example, Ethereum suffered the same thing for a while. And there's so many examples of this. It just didn't matter at all. And I don't think it's going to matter for NFT. So I think whenever you see these bad takes on, on Twitter and you might be and, and other places and you may be getting frustrated by it, that the popular consensus is that like it's all worthless, NFTs are scams, it's you know, it's killing the planet, all this sorts of stuff. Just remember that while you can't win a narrative war, uh, as in you can you, know, you can't fight back against this because it's like it's it's a very popular kind of narrative. The, the thing is, is that if something actually has true value to a large number of people, doesn't matter what anyone says, unless it's like outright banned, like by global governments everywhere, it's going to keep growing. It's going to keep getting traction. It's going to keep providing value to people. It doesn't matter what others say. You know, I, it, it's funny. I remember reading kind of like, and still to this day, if you go outside the crypto bubble and you read about crypto, not NFTs, but like other kind of like crypto things like Bitcoin and Ethereum outside of the bubble, there are still plenty of people who think, that it's either a get rich quick get rich quick scheme or is a scam or is providing no value to people or is using too much energy which to be fair i mean obviously it's using a lot of energy right and ethereum is guilty of that too but we're moving to proof of stake can't wait for that day but when you really kind of like take this all in context, you re you realize that um, all of this doesn't matter, right? People t people can talk as much as they want, but what really matters is the reality of the situation. And the reality is that NFTs are not going anywhere. If, uh, massive billion dollar companies, uh, multi, I mean, you know, hundred plus billion dollar companies, trillion dollar company, Microsoft's a trillion dollar company. These companies are getting heavily, heavily involved in this industry because they see the future. They see, and they're taking action. They're not just talking about it. They're taking action. Whereas as the people who hate NFTs, they take no action. They do nothing. They put together Twitter threads. They hate on everyone trying to do NFTs, um, you know, whether it's warranted or not. Most of the time, it's not warranted. And from that perspective, I would say just ignore them. They're irrelevant. Don't don't listen to them. Just keep doing what you're doing, whether you're involved in an NFT project, whether you're thinking of minting your own NFTs to to do stuff. I mean, you know, we we minted the Daily Way NFTs and we donated uh, most of the proceeds to ETH Core devs. There's a lot of good that comes out of this stuff. And I think that people will realize that over time. I think that the sentiment will shift over time, but it's just, we have to keep building, right? We have to keep doing these things and the NFT people and the NFT ecosystem is building. They're not just talking about it. They're building the future that they want to see. And if people adopt it, they adopt it. People get allowed to do whatever they want with their money and their time like the fact that some people think they can control what other people do is uh, is quite crazy to me but that's the kind of like world we live in but uh yeah i'll leave it at that but that's just kind of some some uh, i guess like nft in context talk that i wanted to kind of bring up there uh, and last thing about NFTs was that uh, OpenSea today announced that they have acquired Dharma. So this is pretty pretty big, I think. Dharma's been around for quite a while now. Uh, they were an Ethereum wallet from very early on that tried to do a lot of DeFi stuff. I think from 2018, they've been around. So um, now they're joining kind of like the OpenSea family. I'm sure OpenSea is going to tap into Dharma's kind of like wallet and mobile wallet experience here to... I guess, um, uh, kind of like bring that to the OpenSea uh, app and things like that. I believe uh, Dharma's CEO is actually becoming or this the CTO of OpenSea, which is pretty cool. So it's basically an aqua hire. I don't think it was uh, disclosed how much this kind of like aqua hire was for. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure it was for a decent amount here because as I said, Dharma's been around for quite a while. They've been doing a lot of really great stuff and now they're joining the OpenSea family. So and kind of see a bit of a thread and a blog post about this if you want to read more info and dive deeper into this. I'll link this in the YouTube description below. So Poop announced today that they have raised $10 million in a seed funding round. Now, of, of course, full disclosure here, I participated in this round as a strategic angel investor. And I mean, how couldn't I, right? Like Poop is one of my favorite projects in the crypto ecosystem. I've talked about them lots of times before. I'm sure all of you have at least one Poop. Um, I'm sure many of you have lots of them. I mean, especially the people uh, that are big uh, kind of like Rocket Pool fans and Rocket Pool community members. I know you guys are really big fans of Poops and um, you 
you, you guys created one for me when I jumped in there with my <laughs> when you guys found out that my, my, I had a, an issue with my validator that was just like a really silly issue. Um, so so yeah, but no, this is this is really awesome. I'm going. I'm scrolling down here to uh, w uh, to the information about the raise. Uh, yeah, the round the round was basically led by uh, Archetype and Sapphire Sport LLC uh, with participation from a bunch of other Web3 native funds like One KX and Six Man Ventures and Delphi Digital, A Capital here, and then uh, around 50 strategic angels participated as well. They're not named here, but as I said, I invested as part of this round. Now, what I like about this blog post is most of it focuses on what Pop is, the vision for what they want to be, how they're going to get there, uh, you know, what 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 they what they kind of like see being the most value out of Pop and and everything like that, rather than the fundraise itself. So this is really really cool. I I really really love this. I really love that they focused on this sort of stuff and focused on kind of like the value add rather than just like the money that they raise because obviously the money that they raise is awesome. Like ten ten million dollars is going to give them a lot of runway to do what they want to do and to build what they want to build but the real kind of like um the real important thing is focusing on the actual products that they're building right the actual value that they're adding to the ecosystem to end users and there's a lot of value here i mean i think identity in general is going to become a very big deal going forward and i've talked i've spoken about this before with projects like signing with ethereum and and sismo and and and, and gitcoin's doing a lot of stuff here but basically on-chain identity is still a relatively unsolved uh, kind of like um, problem and it's something that needs to to have a lot of focus on it because if we're all going to live online, which we do already, but if we're going to live in kind of like this metaverse, whether it be, you know, actually in the metaverse with VR goggles or whether it's just kind of like existing online, um, we need a way to kind of like have this identity where we, where we pr protect our identity, but still have an online kind of like presence like that, but, you know, still have privacy and, and, and all that sorts of stuff there. And Pop is playing a big, big role there because of things like, you know, I mean, POP stands for, as you guys know, proof of attendance protocol. And just like the basic primitive of being able to kind of like prove that you were somewhere or prove that you attended the, attended an event or prove something through an NFT, through a POP is awesome. And you could even kind of, I guess, um, uh, 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 you can you can kind of like extend this with um, with Sismo, where essentially if you have pop-ups on on a wallet that you don't want to be public, but you want to prove to people that you have this pop-up, well, you can use Sismo to do this because then you can basically say, okay, well, here's a zero knowledge proof that I actually own this pop-up on another address that I own, but I'm not going to tell you what the address is because I want to keep that private. But here's you know cryptographic proof that I actually own it. So all of these things are blending together, and we're actually going to get, I think, to a point where we actually build out the full identity stack in a really nice decentralized proper way uh, using the tools that have been around for a while. As I said, like POAP, signing with Ethereum, Sysmo, there's a few others out there like um, that, that, that come under the Gitcoin umbrella or at least a, a part, uh, not a part of Gitcoin, but like work with Gitcoin, like proof of humanity and stuff like that. And I think once we kind of like solve that, it just like opens the floodgates to, to everything else. So yeah, once again, congrats to POAP on this raise. Very happy to be part of this myself as well. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing what they do going forward. So speaking of Rocket Pool, just before uh, they put out some stats today. So a busy two weeks for Rocket Pool. The RE supply has grown by 8.69%, which is a 226% annualized growth rate. Node operator count has grown by about the same amount, almost 9%. The mini pool count has grown by about the same amount there. And the effective RPL staked has grown by about 9.2%. So very, very nice to see this. You know, I was having a brief discussion in the Discord channel today about staking on your own and staking as a kind of like rocker pool node and i think um tom decent i think he, uh, i think his name is was uh was saying that you can earn a lot more staking through rocker pool than you can kind of like staking on your own validator uh because you get the kind of like rpl on top of it now i was kind of saying that it's kind of an apples to origins comparison comparison because there is extra risk by using rocker pool instead of staking on your own um but the thing is is that you know is how how my, how big is the risk like for me personally the risk is still too large, just 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 for me personally, and and but the fact is like I have the thirty two ETH necessary to to stake on my own, so for me it's a bit of a different kind of like um thing to think about. But if you don't have the thirty two ETH necessary to stake, and you only have the uh, uh just to, to kind of like um to stake on your own, then Rocket Pool is obviously the solution uh, for you. But I think um, what Tom was was comparing uh, was 32 ETH in, in both scenarios where with the Rocket Pool one, you would stake 16 ETH and then 16 ETH worth of... Um, 
with a rocker pool, I believe. And then you get kind of like, you make more money from doing that, but you also take on the extra risk. And this is not to say that rocker pool is a risky project or is a bad, uh, bad project, or is you're going to lose all your money or anything like that. But Anytime you introduce any new kind of like mechanisms or contracts or anything, you do take on the additional risk. So just you just need to be aware of that. But I mean, the amount of uh, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the amount of difference between staking on your own and staking with Rocket Pool right now is quite large. So it would definitely make sense if you're looking uh, to stake to, to go through Rocket Pool. So jumping to I, I can't remember what channel it was in in the Discord channel, probably the ETH2 channel or something like that. Um, probably jump into there and find the conversation uh, to see the numbers around that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been great to see Rocket Pool continue to grow here and uh, opening the decentralized staking up to a much wider set of participants, not just those who, who can kind of like uh, afford it with the 32 ETH um, requirement there. So David Mihal announced yesterday that he is building a, a new kind of, I guess, like website or a new service called CryptoStats. So he's building this here with um, uh, Mike uh, and crypto, what CryptoStats is aiming to be is an aggregate data, uh, to, it, to, it's aiming to aggregate data for every useful crypto metric, ensure the data is trustworthy and make it available to all. Now, you guys will probably be aware of David. I've, I've talked about him a few times on the refuel. He's the guy behind uh, CryptoFees.info and a bunch of other websites like l 2 fees.info and moneymovers.info, very popular websites. I use them all the time. And now he's launching the crypto stats with Mike. And basically, as I said, like crypto stats is, is aiming to aggregate data, data for all useful crypto metrics. You can kind of like uh, jump into the blog post here for more details about what they're trying to do. But essentially, this is kind of like the stack, right? You have blockchains and protocols uh, uh, like Ethereum and Bitcoin and Polygon. Then you have indexes like um zero on uh, the graph coin metrics. Then you have uh, 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 the normalization of this kind of like data uh, with crypto stats. And then uh, th that that's kind of like where, where they sit. And then this data can be presented as part of kind of like, you know, uh, crypto fees or Bloomberg or, or wherever, else, wherever else. So basically just giving a really easy way for all the, uh, for anyone to tap into, but basically all these different various crypto metrics, which I think is a really, really cool. So uh, if you want to kind of like get started with this or, I mean, it, because it's live, today and you're kind of like a developer, you can go check this out. They've already got a... Um and an SDK going. Uh, as I said, it's already live and they've got a bunch of different metrics that you can tap into and there's resources and a Discord channel and all that good stuff in the blog post. So I'll link this in the YouTube description and you can go check it out for yourself. But I guess congrats to David and Mike here for, uh, for launching this. Very, very excited to see where they go with this. And finally, Arbitrum uh, put out a tweet today saying that they are hiring. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out here that, uh, I mean, technically Off-Chain Labs is hiring the team behind Arbitrum, but you can go here uh, to jobs.lever.co slash Off-Chain Labs and check out all the positions. Of course, this will be linked in the YouTube description. There seems to be something for everyone here, or at least for most people. So you can see here, they've, they're looking for a partnerships manager in the business development uh, field here, and then looking for a bunch of engineers. So any type of like, software security engineers, uh, DevOps engineer, and even a web developer. So if you fit into any of these kind of roles here, definitely apply. Because I mean, who wouldn't want to work for an L2 team, right? Like I think, you know, the funny thing is, I think if I wasn't uh, doing what I'm doing and I was kind of like wanting to work within the, uh, you know, work a normal job within kind of like the Web3 crypto Ethereum ecosystem, I would definitely land at, an, at a layer two kind of like team. That I mean, I, I think that that would be kind of like be the coolest place to work because you're on like the bleeding edge of one of the biggest, I guess, like issues that need to be solved within the Ethereum ecosystem. And you get to kind of like provide a crap ton of value to people because at the end of the day, the um, most people are going to, I mean, all everyone is going to be onboarding on, on layer twos and you're going to have a direct impact on, peop on people's experiences uh, using that infrastructure. So yeah, anyway, definitely go check out all of these roles you can apply on, on this website here, but I think that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.